Welcome to Stand Up for Doctors. I'm your host, Kim Downey. Thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to welcome Dr. Isla Bates and Dr. Gloria Asaraka. Thanks for joining us today, Isla and Gloria. Hi, Kim. Thanks for having us. <laughs> you're, hi, happy hi, to you're, you're very welcome. I'm very happy to have you both on today. And uh, by way of introducing uh, you both, Isla is a child, adolescent, and adult, adult psychiatrist, fine artist, author, and speaker. She leverages 25 years of psychiatric expertise to enhance creativity, innovation, and well-being through the power of art and positive psychiatry. And Gloria is a board-certified adult and forensic psychiatrist and the medical director at Columbia Associates. And I was honored to meet Gloria in person a few months ago. <laughs> I was in the D.C. area for a family wedding, and uh, you came to where I was staying, and we saw each other across a busy street, right? <laughs> and <laughs> had a big smile, shared a hug, went to a restaurant, had I had my first chicken and waffles with you, and we had some mimosas. It was awesome. <laughs> 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 uh, so uh, today we'll be talking about Isla's well-shared Kevin MD article, What Rush Patient Encounters Are Doing to Patients and Physicians, and you wrote that back, or she published it 2019, November, so five years later, it's mm -hmm. just as relevant as it was then. And uh, Isla is passionate about the doctor-patient relationship and how doctors can better connect with patients. She believes this promotes healing and well-being for both the doctor and the patient. And I could not agree more, a thousand plus percent. So I'm excited that we'll be speaking to that. And uh, Gloria will speak to physician as leader in reference to self-leadership and what that means in both personal and professional settings, balancing work and personal commitments. So I'm very grateful to have you both on today. And I'll start by asking what you'd most like our audience to know about you as we begin our conversation. Isla, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, well, I think, you know, you've said most of what I think is really important, and that is the doctor-patient relationship and how we can improve that, especially with uh, today's dependence on technology, which I think has caused a lot of doctors to veer away from some of the more uh, humanistic aspects of patient care that we really need, both need. The doctor needs it as well as the patient such as direct eye contact and really um, really connecting with the patient, finding out what are they, what do they like? What are their hobbies? Um, how many kids do they have and what are their kids doing? So that it becomes a conversation. And these things really just take one or two minutes. They don't take a long time. So if you only have a limited amount of time, I think just a one-liner that reminds you and the patient that you've connected in some way. So put something at the top of the chart. This person is an artist or whatever, and then ask them, how's it going? Just a simple question like that can really make a difference, I think, in, in the patient's life. Um, I know what it's like to be a patient, and I also know what it's like to be a doctor. So I've been on both sides. And um, I think that that's helped me to really increase my compassion, self-compassion, as well as compassion for my patients. Absolutely. I love all of that. And I felt that too. And as you both know, I'm a healthcare professional and a patient myself. And when a doctor asked me about, you know, like one of my hobbies or what do I like to do at first, I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> and then I shared something and then that's been a point of connection. And then another doctor and I talk about our vacations and uh, he has a 10 year old son that always likes to go to the same place. <laughs> so we kind of joke around like the different places that I've been. And then, uh, you know, every time I'm like, oh, you've been to, you know, so-and-so where he, where he usually goes and it, it it does help increase that connection so i i I've, I've had that lived experience and i i fully agree thank you uh gloria what would you like most like our audience to know about you um i guess i would say i am a fierce advocate for a physician and provider wellness um i firmly believe that hard work and dedication um, that physicians put into becoming professionals should translate to something um, preferably a desirable lifestyle. Um, and so what that means for everyone looks a little different. Um, you know, especially, you know, in the world where we as physicians and providers can find ourselves so busy, 
Um, it's important that we have our values aligned with things that are important to us so that we can manage our time in a way that allows us to take care of ourselves and our patients better. Um, I fir firmly believe that everyone in the healthcare system has an important role to play. And without that, you know, we can't, we can't have success. So that's what I'm really passionate about is everyone recognizing their importance um, in the larger healthcare system and what can be done to improve it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And as you both know, I'm passionate about physician wellness myself. So uh, that's something that we all share in common as well. Um, Isla, would, Isla, would you like to speak a little more to your article uh, that was shared over uh, 13,000 times? And I think that's how we connected. I, I think I saw you shared a post about it oh. on LinkedIn and then I, and I went to read it and, I, and the whole article resonated so deeply with me that I reached out to you. And I think that's why we had our conversation. Yeah, it's um it's been a while um since I wrote it in 2019 right before the pandemic too. Um I think that you know when I trained in in the 90s, the late 80s, 90s, um we were very much in tune with uh taking a patient history, really evaluating a patient and examining them. So the you know, we were really good at being a diagnostician. It's it's kind of a lost art, you know, where we, no matter what specialty you had, psychiatry, surgery, whatever, you knew how to examine a patient. You knew what signs to look for. And the article speaks about me meeting a young physician who said he was very happy with his work and his job. And I started to talk to him about, you know, how long do you spend with patients? He said, oh, about 40 minutes, you know, is his initial evaluation with them. And he thought that was a really long time. You know, <laughs> I personally didn't think it was a long time because I'm more old school, as he told me that I was old school in my thinking. Um, he said that he focused on very specific things with the patient and didn't kind of look at the broader picture. And I felt like maybe he might be missing something, you know, and, and, and that's what I worry about the most. And I feel that hospitals really need to give patient doctors more time with their patients so that they can speak mm -hmm. to them, really examine them and get to know them. I feel that if doctors have more time with patients, we're not gonna miss things patients aren't going to come in with stage four of something because we'll really know who that patient is. And I, I believe that, you know, medicine has changed so much that we have too much of a reliance on electronics, um, on, on the technology, labs, imaging, and nobody's touching you. As a patient, mm -hmm. doctors don't examine me anymore. Mm -hmm. They just look at the labs. And if my symptoms or complaints don't correlate with the labs, then, then it, you know, it's not there or it's in your head. So as a psychiatrist, I tend to see the patients who get dismissed mm. and, and never mind talking about patients of color. That's mm. a whole nother issue as well that factors in. Absolutely. Uh, a couple of things that you said that really stood out to me is when you talk about uh, doctors needing more time with their patients. One of my specialists, the office staff had said when they're uh, at the hospital that they're expected to see patients every 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, because like me as a physical therapist, like it would take me 15 minutes to review a patient's chart, right? And then you would spend much longer meeting them, evaluating. And I'm like, I feel like doctors are expected to do impossible things. Like how can you read the chart, get the information, see the patient, you know, meet them, develop a level of comfort and come up with like a treatment plan or try to adjust their medications and keep doing that every 15 minutes. Like that, it, it just sounds actually absurd to me. And then another thing, which is, I guess you could say nice and sad at the same time is just yesterday, someone shared something on LinkedIn about um, how nurses being kind have simulated someone holding their hand by their taking like rubber gloves 
and filling them with warm water and taping them to like the top or somehow attaching to the top and bottom of somebody's hand. So it feels like a warm hand. And mm -hmm. in a way you're like, oh, it's, it's very nice that they thought to do that. But how sad gone are the days where like a nurse yeah. or family members were actually sitting there holding somebody's hand, you know? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I think as, as humans, we really need that. We need that, um, physical contact touch, you know, um, without yeah. gloves. I mean, 98% of the time, we're not going to catch anything from our patients. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And the healing, no. of the, of, yeah, of, of uh, the healing human touch. So Gloria, if you would like to respond to anything that uh, Isla talked about, and then, um, you know, we could also talk about uh, physician leaders. Yeah, I just found her article so interesting and especially the component of touch, um, because you know that can be somewhat of a controversial topic in the field of psychiatry. You know, oh, there, yeah. there are many psychiatrists that believe, you know, we should never touch the patient. You know, mm -hmm. they believe that's not part of our job. Uh, but I actually, you know, hold a similar op opinion as Isla. You know, I actually work as an interventional psychiatrist, um, doing ECT and TMS, and in those treatments, you have to touch the patient. And oftentimes part of the patient's uh, healing process is having that provider touch, you know? And so I think that's a really unique opportunity to connect with our patients um, in, in a meaningful way, right? Um, you know, psych psychiatry, in the field of psychiatry, we get to learn some of the most intimate parts of patients' lives and their personal stories. And so if you remove that element of human touch and interaction, I think you're really missing the mark on being able to make a difference in your patient's lives. Um, so absolutely, I, I'm 100% a component of that. Um, and I also agree, you know, that it it's an impossible task that we have of 15 minutes, you're expected to know everything. Uh, because when you what when that really boil what that really boils down to is you spending time before the patient comes in to review the records. And no one ever talks about all of that time that you have to spend prepping for charts. You know, it's it's not considered a billable time, right? And so if it's not billable, it doesn't matter or it didn't happen. But in fact, it's real. And physicians are spending that time, which is time away from doing other things, right? Um, which is um, which is kind of what, where what I'm so passionate about because I believe that sometimes physicians find themselves lost in terms of who they really are because they tie so much of their value to their uh, to the results of their being a physician, like the end product. Oh, I'm a good doctor because I finish all my notes on time. Uh, I'm a good doctor because I'm the most productive person in my practice. And then you really get this warped sense of self um, that at the end of the day, you don't even know who you are. Um, you know, when, when you start to refer to yourself as Dr. So-and-so, mm -hmm. that's a sign that you might have lost a sense of self, right? And so sometimes I, you know, I really enjoy when people call me Gloria because I don't hear my first name <laughs> that often in the workplace. Um, and then I, it's, it's a subtle reminder that there are many elements of who I am as a person, um, not just a physician, right? I'm, I'm a mom. I'm a friend, I'm a wife, I'm a daughter. Um, and all of those aspects of myself is what I bring to my work as a physician, right? Um, and so I think that that's, that's the real value in having an experienced practitioner is that you have someone who has life experience, um, not just in medicine, but in life as a whole, which is what makes you connect with your patients. Um, you know, when you talk about the topic of physician leadership, I believe, you know, before you can lead anyone else, you first have to lead yourself, right? Um, you first have to know what's important to you. You first have to know how to manage your time well, right? And all of those things um, are what makes you able to help other people. Um, you know, part of my journey as an early career uh, psychiatrist and leader was really identifying what are the core components of my life that I can't do without. Um, so like one of those is eating healthy. You know, I, 
I can't do without nourishing my body um, because if I don't have good nutrients, I don't have energy. Um, another one is I can't do without exercise, you know? Um, and for me, I've always um, found value in exercising with others um, because that helps me connect. And that's oftentimes some of the only time that I have to connect with other people outside of work. And so those are aspects of my life that really have helped me become a better leader, you know, just focusing on holistic self-care, focusing on um, managing my time and balancing my priorities. Um, I think that has really helped me take care, take better care of my patients. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing. And I'll have uh, Isla respond to that. Two things that you said that really stood out to me is which we both talked about are the three of us is um the importance of human touch and and how that affects healing uh you know in medicine and i know for myself as a physical therapist i feel that i can confidently say that i never had a visit with a patient where i didn't touch them and of course physical therapy is a little different but i i have to say and the reason i'm bringing this up is there's a couple people one is another physical therapist um one was a friend and one was a family member who have all seen physical therapists in recent years where the therapist didn't touch them. And I almost could not believe that. I was like, how is that even possible? And some of it, and you're just, you know, when a, a, just a gentle hand on the back or whatever, or just when you're examining somebody, it, it just, it makes a huge difference. It really does. And then uh, the other thing that you said, Gloria, is it's uh, speaking to what is a good doctor and what does that mean, right? And actually, I recorded an episode fairly recently with a, a couple of um, a gynecologists, Dr. Manji O'Brien, he's in the UK, and uh, Dr. Yashika Dooley here in the US. And we actually had a bit of a conversation about that. Like, what does it mean to be a good doctor? Um, so mm -hmm. Isla, go ahead. Yeah, so I want to go back to the topic of touch. And um, when I was referring to touch, it was uh, as a diagnostician, you know, number one, being able to do a thorough physical exam, looking at everything, feet. I don't know the last time a doctor looked at my feet. Really important parts of the exam are getting left out, taking socks off, um, really looking at the nail beds, the hands, the eyes, uh, looking, you know, in the ears, the nose, the mouth. So much of the physical exam gets skipped. And the other thing is, in psychiatry, we're not supposed to touch our patients. So I'm a child psychiatrist, kids run up to you and hug you, you're supposed to peel them off, you know, <laughs> not supposed to have any kind of contact. That really removes that human element. Um, and I think that it's that way because there are different types of touch. Their sexual touch and the me, the whole me too thing, I think has made people really afraid to touch. But it is a very important element as long as it's got the appropriate boundaries. So I want to put that in just so that people don't think that it's mm -hmm. okay to touch every patient. It, it, you know, there's appropriate and inappropriate touch. Um, so yeah, I wanted to make that point. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And I think, and as a psychiatrist, just that you're, you know, aware uh, of just the importance of that physical exam and those things and you're absolutely right. The things that you're talking about is looking at somebody's feet, you know, and, and uh, I've, I've accompanied my mom to uh, uh, a doctor, an initial visit and then a follow up. And he didn't, he didn't come on our side of the table, actually, right? right. <laughs> yeah. And, I do want to say that, you know, my background is a little bit different than most psychiatrists because I did a year of internal medicine, a year of ophthalmology, and, and then I went into psychiatry, and I've never really forgotten all of, the, you know, the other elements. And so when I look at a patient, I'm looking at them holistically, everything. I want to know all their labs. I want to, mm -hmm. you know... Uh, really get information on how they're doing physically, because a lot of the elements of, you know, physical um, can, can look psychiatric too. There's so many disease states that appear to be psychiatric and one has to decipher, um, you know, what, what's going on. And so that makes me really proud to be a psychiatrist because we're a bit of a detective. 
Um, and, you know, when people are very difficult to diagnose, sometimes we're the ones who really can advocate for them and help them, especially with a psychiatric diagnosis where there is stigma attached to it. Mm -hmm. They don't always get the, the attention that they need. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Gloria. No, I like that last piece that she said, we're a bit of a detective, um, because that's actually why I went into forensic psychiatry. Mm -hmm. I, I especially enjoyed that component of paying attention to the details, um, because so many people think that psychiatry is such an easy field. Like, you know, you just have to talk to the patient and listen to their problems, but there's so much more to that, right? There's so much more to really being able to capture a good history from a patient and to be able to tie those pieces together. Um, and so I guess I'm a little bit biased, but I think that no other specialty is able to tie the pieces together as well as psychiatrists. Um, I just think it's a unique skill that we get in our training that really sets us apart from other physicians. Now, there may be people who don't really know what forensic psychiatry is, if you'd like to explain that. So forensic psychiatry is an area of psychiatry that focuses on the intersection of psychiatry and the law. Um, so any element um, in a patient's life um, that, you know, where they may come in contact with the criminal justice system, or they may need a behavioral health specialist for something outside of treatment. Um, so it might be to determine their capacity to work, or, you know, if they're able to um, you know, go certain places without posing a risk to society. So it's such a broad field. Um, many people don't really know about, uh, but it, I think it's a very uh, crucial aspect uh, or component of psychiatry as a whole. Absolutely. Um, Isla, if you'd like to respond to Gloria and also if you want to talk to speak at all to art and how you're helping physicians heal through art. Yeah, so I started out as an artist, um, the Parsons School of Design graduate, worked as a fashion designer, traveled all over the world, but still had this yearning to be a physician. Mm -hmm. And so being a physician is my second career or third, <laughs> however you want to look at it. And um, but I was uh, working, you know, sometimes 130 hours a week. I mean, they were, the rules were very different then. And I got lost in medicine and I lost myself. I think Gloria talked a little bit about this earlier is that it's very easy to lose yourself in medicine and just work all the time, especially if you're trying to raise a child. And, um, and I started to feel that something was missing and I started buying the art of other artists. And my daughter one day said to me, mom, I think you can do this. <laughs> Stop buying art from other people. <laughs> and um, and it and I started painting. And that's when I reconnected with myself and found joy. And so a lot of the work I do is is helping others uh, incorporate art into clinical medicine, which can be done in any specialty, whether you're a surgeon explaining a procedure. Um, I use drawing as a meditative process as well. And I do workshops, um, and so I could go on and on about it, but I, mm -hmm. I won't. But it, it is the part of of uh, that brings me joy. And a lot of my patients are creatives and artists, and I am able to really work with them um, as well and get them unstuck from anxiety, depression, and so That's on. That's beautiful, and I can fully appreciate that because, as you both know, I've gone through uh, cancer treatment, you know, a few times over the past few years, and we have this wonderful local cancer support center called Anne's Place, and they have all kind of offerings from, you know, uh, meditation to writing groups, and then different art things, and everything from taking, you know, pansies on a, uh, you know, whatever absorbent piece of paper and pounding them and making no cards, you know, but just even the pounding and and using beautiful flowers to uh, make making, you know, messy art, you know, to just, just, you know, getting the acrylics out there, or whatever, and, uh, you know, and, and, and just having at it. And then even what's behind me was like this soul collage thing. They gave us prompts, and then we picked pictures out of magazines and tissue paper. And uh, so I, I fully appreciate what you're saying. And uh, Gloria, I know you've mentioned to me that one of your hobbies is, is collecting art. How does this all resonate with you? 
Absolutely. I, I think it's important to be able to enjoy the beauty of life. Um, I think, you know, sometimes as physicians, we are so busy that we we sometimes don't take time to recognize the beauty of the, the simple things around us. So it can be, you know, the, looking at the trees, looking at the grass, um, you know, and I, I never really uh, realized how passionate I was about art until, you know, my dad gave me some paintings mm -hmm. and I started collecting them. And I said, wow, this is really makes my house beautiful, you know, to collect this art and to have it up, you know, it's just a visual reminder that there's so much more to life than what we see right in front of us. Um, and so for me, collecting art is a way um, to circumnavigate being able to travel. So like if I can't travel well, maybe I can bring the world to me in my home, right? So, um, you know, get different pieces, you know, keep my house colorful. I think that that really, um, it makes me happy to be able to uh, bring diversity into my home um, through artwork. And so I really enjoy that. I love that. And yeah. uh, Isla, is there anything else that you wanted to make sure we cover as far as in regards to like the doctor patient relationship and uh, the healing nature of that? There's so much I could say. I know. <laughs> There's so much I could say. Um, but yeah, I think drawing art, uh, art in any form, it doesn't have to be great. And I think a lot of us stop ourselves because we place judgment on it. But just freeing yourself and doodling or whatever form you, it takes, it's healing. Um, the World Health Organization has done a lot of research on this, so if it, people need evidence to back it up. Um, but this is really uh, cathartic for a lot of us who are maybe ill or burning out. Um, I highly recommend taking an art class. Yeah. Absolutely. And that you hit on a key thing is that just doing it the process itself is healing. It's exactly. not the end product and you don't have to, um, you know, sell it at the Guggenheim, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't have to take a lot of time either, you know, in between patients, if you want to just try drawing something or doodling for five minutes, it can help to lower your cortisol levels, lower stress. Mm -hmm. 20 minutes of drawing will lower your cortisol levels. Mm -hmm. I, I, I believe that. Uh, so Gloria, yeah. as we're starting to wind down, if there's anything else you wanted to say about um, uh, physician and leadership, or if you had any top tips for your colleagues, or even uh, what has helped you overcome challenges, whatever you'd like else you'd like to speak to. I think I would like to share an old African proverb. Um, and the proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, I'm a firm believer that we can't do anything by ourselves. Uh, you know, we don't live in a vacuum. We live in a world with other people. And the way to be successful is to learn how to work with other people, right? Um, the healthcare system especially is a system in, in which collaboration enhances productivity. Collaboration makes things move forward. And so I firmly believe that as physicians, we have to be advocates for the change that we wish to see in the healthcare system, right? So we have to be the leaders <laughs> that we are trained to be, uh, because I, you know, I firmly believe that physicians are trained to be leaders, whether they know it or not. Re residency, you know, you are you're on call, you're by yourself, you know, you have all of these responsibilities, and you do that day in and day out, day in and day out. And it, it creates a certain sense of, of self in you. It, it helps you um, navigate the world. And so I think by the time, you know, most physicians finish residency, they sometimes, you know, forget all of those things that they learned, all right? And they just kind of go into autopilot. Um, I, I really think it's important to, you know, remember the things that made you pursue medicine and also the things that you enjoy outside of medicine. Um, so that you can really bring your best self to work, to your families, and to those around you. Absolutely. I love that. And I love how you say, you know, collaboration over competition, uh, because that sometimes I've heard can be difficult for physicians because they compete to get into med schools, they compete to get into residencies, they compete for the attending job, and then they're expected to collaborate. 
<laughs> uh, so Hisla, if you Hisla, if you would like to uh, you know, wind down and anything, if you'd like to speak to that, any top tips for your colleagues? Yes, I think um, we can gain so much more with generosity, kindness, and really looking out for each other and supporting each other as physicians rather than competing with each other, um, which I think is more detrimental to us than anything else. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree 100%. And uh, uh, Gloria, how can our listeners get in touch with you? Via LinkedIn, you know, social media. I think everyone has access to social media these days. And, you know, I thoroughly enjoy anytime I get a message from someone that wants to connect through LinkedIn. Um, so um, just search my name and you'll be able to find me. Okay, awesome. And uh, Isla, you've shared some links with me uh, and I'll put those in the show notes. Uh, how can our listeners get in touch with you? Well, I also have a podcast, uh, Healer, Heal Yourself, Reduce Burnout, Discover Your Creativity While You Heal Others. And, um, and I also am on Instagram a lot. And you can DM me through Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, most social media. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It was uh, really wonderful to have you both as my guests. And I loved it as well that uh, Isla is a seasoned, you know, a psychiatrist and, and Gloria is in more of the early stages of the careers and just seeing, you know, how much synergy you have together. And I think you can motivate and inspire each other, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I appreciate that. So uh, thanks again for being my guest today. Thank you, Kim. It was great. <laughs> okay, you're welcome. You're very welcome. So in closing, to move the needle in healthcare, we all need to raise our voices and we all need to care about each other. We already know that doctors need to care about patients. Patients need to care about doctors too. So stand up doctors and let's stand up for doctors. All right. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs>